Right, this is the second session now. We're going to be a bit later than we thought, but um, I hope you think it's, is, it's worth it. Is this okay here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This, this uh, second session is called How Much Do We Owe the Poor? The Cost, cost of Living price, uh, a Crisis. And in particular, the Jewish aspects of that. Yeah. So, folks, um, I, I just want to say that during the, during the break, uh, a couple of people expressed um, their views that uh, the problem with artificial intelligence is that uh, it can't be relied on, which I think is a beautiful um, uh, and sunny view of the world because, of course, human beings can't be relied on either. I don't know <laughs> why that's a useful thing to say. Um, you know, it's, it's only as bad, isn't it, as human beings. Uh, somebody else said to me, that they're not bothered about this because human beings will invariably kind of disagree and split up into different groups and, and we're all going to have different opinions all the time so that there's no possibility of anything like AI taking over. But in actual fact, of course, that's exactly what we should worry about because AI has the capacity to be sure. That might be a human quality which is really important. We don't teach it enough which is uncertainty, right? the humility that I might be wrong. That's a very important quality, which, of course, totalitarian dictators don't have. They never think that they might be wrong. Totalitarian systems never think they might be wrong. This is the way the world should work. This is the master race, or whatever it might be. One could easily imagine that artificial intelligence could replicate that kind of conviction that it does know the answer, that it is better educated, that it has absorbed all the data, and therefore its solution is correct. So there is a possibility, let alone of dictators taking over artificial intelligence for their own benefit, that's one thing, um, but also artificial intelligence itself, as it becomes more sophisticated, um, uh, uh, uniting while human beings are still squabbling about not being sure. And that's why, of course, democracy so frequently feels itself weak in the face of, of dictatorship, because democracy is built on uncertainty and, uh, and division, uh, and dictatorship isn't. So, just uh, picking up a couple of things that were said in the break there. But now we're going to move towards another um, issue, which is, of course, the cost of living crisis, a modern uh, issue, and perhaps more modern, uh, than any of the others, because in some ways the cost of living crisis suddenly sprung upon us in this last couple of years. Um, and put simply, the information is that uh, inflation has risen very rapidly uh, in the last little while. Um, we started to mention a little bit about uh, how employment has become more insecure for the poor, uh, especially. Um, inequality has risen dramatically over the last four or five years. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, Britain has a significant number of people living in significant poverty. Now, first of all, I want to dismiss the suggestion that poverty is an absolute as far as Britain is concerned. We are not talking about, um, you know, starvation and, and uh, in general. I mean, there are individuals who suffer from malnutrition um, in the same way as there are people without, uh, you know, without shelter and who die of hypothermia and things like that. But I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about broadly what we might say is relative poverty. Because poverty is not only about whether you have enough food to stay alive, it's also about whether you have enough stuff to uh, have a level of self-respect and contentment, which means that your life is livable with any kind of pleasure, uh, satisfaction, whatever it might be. Uh, and that's why, in measuring poverty, it's nearly always measured relative to uh, sort of general wealth or, 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 or lifestyle. So we all know that now we would consider somebody poor if they didn't have, uh, you know, a, a, a decent place to live in, you know, a bed to sleep on, a table to eat their meal off, and things like that. Well, I mean, there are people all over the world who don't have a bed to sleep in, and but that's not an argument, is it? In in Britain, poverty is uh, being well below where other people are, right? 
Um, so it might be, and I'm not going to try and uh, get, engage in some debate about exact definitions of poverty, but it might be that we would want to argue that a person who cannot give their child a, a bit of a holiday can't take their child to some level of entertainment, you know, to the fun fair or uh, let alone a day out in Alton Towers or something, but can't give their child any, any fun or can't buy their child a Christmas present or somebody, something. Um, is poor. Whereas we all know that in some places in Africa, the idea of buying a child a Christmas was just bonkers and off the scale. But here, that would feel like such deprivation. It would feel so desperate, so much like a failed life, that that's intolerable, I would argue. Uh, and so I don't want to get into the exact argument, you know, these people have colored televisions, you know, or whatever. I don't want to get into that. Um, because I think there are certain things that most people would say, oh, well, that's, oh, come on, that's straightforward, that's just a, a decent life, isn't it? Shouldn't everybody have that? I don't mean everybody should have a snazzy car, right? But they should be able to get about a bit. They should be able to get beyond their own street and area without having to walk or borrow a broken bike or whatever. That surely is everybody's ought to be everybody's expectation in our society. So I'm talking about Britain, I'm not talking about the world. We know that British people are obviously, and Britain as a country, is obviously far more affluent than most of the countries of the world. But then it's, it is affluent, it's an affluent country, it's one of the top 20 or so. Um, and uh, we know that, um, that money and wealth is very unequally distributed. Um, and I just want to distinguish between income and wealth. So, um, if you look at the inequalities in society today in Britain, um, you will see that wealth is grossly unequal uh, and income is very unequal. Wealth is grossly unequal and the inequalities have increased. Uh, not, not only between rich and poor, but even between North and South. So the South has become increasingly wealthy and the North have become increasingly poor, uh, in contrast, over the last few years. But I want to warn you away from this information because a significant proportion about, of that is to do with the absurdity of property prices. Right? So this doesn't tell us about the nature of people's living experiences. If you live in a house which is now worth £2 million, this is a matter of no consequence to you until you want to sell it. Right? And if, of course, you want to move into another house very similar to it down the road, it's, it is a matter of no consequence to you because it, it's uh, £2 million worth and you're going to buy another house of £2 million. And, and, you know, what difference? Right? Obviously, if you're going to move from there to... Uh, studio flat in Newcastle, well, you're quids in, right? But, uh, but generally speaking, the fact that your property has risen in value doesn't really say anything very useful about the circumstances of individuals uh, at any given time. But income is significant, right? Um, and in order to get this right, I wrote down some figures because I, I wanted to share that with you. One of the very rare occasions when I use notes, right? Um, but um, the top 20% of British population, uh, its income uh, has gone up in the last five years um, to 4.7%. Uh, right? So, it's, sorry, it's not gone up to, it's gone up by 4.7% in the last five years. The top 20%. So we're not just talking about the super rich, we're talking about a significant proportion of society. The bottom 20%, their income has gone down by 1.6%. Now, these are not vast figures, but they show you that the gap is widening. And this is about income, it's what people get in to do stuff with, right? Um, and uh, so that means that the top 20%, their sort of average income taken overall is 69,000 a year, right? And the bottom 20%, 
their average income is 12.5 thousand a year, right? So between 69,000 and 12.5 thousand. Um, I was uh, chairman of a hospital board uh, back in the day in Haringey, uh, sort of long, thin borough in the north of London, um, abuts onto uh, Tottenham and Hackney in the east, uh, and onto Barnet and others in the west. The life expectancy of people in the east, which is the poor end, compared to people in the west, when I was chairman of my hospital, which was uh, up until uh, about 2006, uh, was 12.3 years different on average from one end of the borough to the other. This is a borough, this is not the country. This is a London borough. 12.3 years difference. I don't remember the actual ages, but let's say approximately that people therefore in the east of the borough might expect to live to 75 and the people in the west of the borough might expect to live to 87. Right? Uh, and I suspect the figures were more depressed than that. Um, so the differentials between rich and poor are evident, significant and growing. Right? I don't think we can have any doubt about that. Um, again, I don't want to particularly uh, overplay you know, the huge use of um, food banks as opposed to what was going on 10 years ago. So I think people have learnt different habits. You know, if there is a food bank, why not use it? Whereas if there weren't any, then people couldn't use it. It wasn't there. Um, so we don't know what was masked and what was not and what's become habitual and what isn't. But nevertheless, we, we know that there is great inequality between the poor and the rich in this country. And the poor is not a small subset of society. It's a significant proportion. We're not just talking about uh, what has come to be called the extreme underclass. Uh, the people who are kind of completely and utterly hopeless, often that's because uh, they've sunk into drug misuse um, you know, they just can't get their act together at all and, uh, and their lives are wasted effectively and nobody's getting on top of it. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people in work, people struggling to cope, people sending their children to school, um, but sending them to school without breakfast uh, because they can't really afford to get that done and hoping for the free school lunch, of course, and then maybe putting something on the table. And that child getting to school all over the place anyway because they didn't eat very well, or they just had something but nothing very much. Uh, so they don't get to, to lunch before they can fuel up and perform at school effectively. So it's not surprising that the gap widens still further. I was deputy director and then director of a local education authority up in Liverpool. And we had about 40 secondary schools in Liverpool. Um, and each year in the summer, I prepared a uh, press release to talk about the exam results. Right? That's what you have to do. This year, and, and, the, and the press release always started with, this year the results from Liverpool schools have been magnificent. In particular, and now I left a dot, 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 so I to put something in, right? Woodwork has been over there. Right? Whatever it is, you'll find something good to put in, in particular. <coughs> However, we do recognise that more work will need to be done in dot, 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 and I fill that in when the time came. Right? It's basically the same press release every year with different fillings in on the dot, dot, dots. But what I did one year was I listed all our secondary schools in order of the proportion of free school meals. Now, free school meals is not a, it's not an exact science, but free school meals is not a bad indicator of poverty, right? Um, you only get them, it's, it's through, it's means tested, so you only get free school meals if your circumstances are not strong. I mean, it's, right? Um, so I put at the top of the list the school with the smallest number of free school meals and at the bottom of the list, the school with the largest number of free school meals. And I said to my colleagues, this list is what we are going to put the GCSE results against. And the only schools we will bother to investigate 
are the ones which are out of place. Right? The, the ones that are remarkably better than you might expect or the ones that are remarkably worse. The ones which are remarkably better, we need to learn what they're doing. The ones which are remarkably worse, we need to address what they're doing. Right? Or not doing. So about 40, I think it was 38, I can't remember. It was about 40 schools. And we put the list against, that's what we ought to expect in terms of GCSE results. And every year, there were four, five schools out of place, out of the 40. Now, I'm not saying it was exactly one, two, three. It might have been one, three, two, that sort of thing. Right? But effectively, schools fell where they were supposed to fall in relation to free school meals. What this tells you is quite simply that GCSE results are directly correlated to poverty or wealth. So schools with very little poverty got very good results. Schools with a lot of poverty got very bad results. Now, is this directly our GCSE uh, results to do with poverty or are they coincidentally to do with some other factor which is also true about poor people I don't know let's take a, a daily mail stereotype right poor people uh, don't know how to have a family life they're all a bunch of single mothers you know out on the town leaving their kids to their own uh, affairs or whatever it might be, right? If you want to take that stereotype, you could go, well, that's what's going on there, really. Right? It's just because they don't have a proper family and that's why they're failing. But I don't think anybody who knows anything about the life of people uh, believes that that's really got any proper credibility. Right? Uh, poor people are as um, determined to pull their lives around as many uh, wealthy people. Many wealthy people are as irresponsible as many poor people. I don't think that's a an issue going on there. But this worked every year. That's, I think that's quite shocking. Because it means to say that, you know, all the effort that goes on into schools to try and get GCSE results up and the teaching and the stuff like that is to do with, you know, whether the walls are damp. Fix that. Maybe you fix the education system. Maybe. So we know that there's inequality in our society. We know that there are some people with more than others. What should we do about it? Now this, of course, is the great um, political debate. And I'm not going to try and get to party politics, although uh, let me state my own bias, because I think it's very important that you know where my bias is. All right. and, and this is something I always used to do when I was a teacher, and I was regularly told that I shouldn't do it, but I think it's dishonest. Teachers are not supposed to reveal their opinions on these things, because if you say, I vote Conservative, or I vote Liberal, Democrat, or whatever it might be, being the teacher, the children might be influenced to think that that's the right thing to do. You might be propagandising. But I think far more dishonest, is to pretend that you don't have a view so that your unconscious bias affects the children and you haven't warned them against it. I think you need to say to them, as I did, I'm a Labour voter, so every time I mention Labour, do remember to treat that with a little bit of suspicion. Because I'm not going to try and influence you, but it may be that I do unintentionally. So just know that. I'm not going to try and say wrong things about the Conservative Party, but it might be that they slip out and I don't mean to. So just remember that when we talk about political matters. I think that's more honest than pretending I'm some kind of perfectly unencumbered individual. I am not, after all, artificial intelligence. right? So, so that's what I used to do. Whether it was right or wrong, that's what I, certainly what I used to do. Um, but I remember saying to my tiny daughter, who, without any um, uh, reservations whatsoever, uh, we taught her when she was about three, um, when she was asked, what do we think of Margaret Thatcher? We taught her to say with vehemence, we don't like her! Right? So I thought that's basic education, really. <laughs> For toddlers, I think that's important. Right? Um, but... 
uh, when she asked me, what's the difference, she must have been about six or seven or eight, I don't know, um, what's the difference between the Conservatives and Labour? I thought at that age, I shouldn't be saying to her, well, you know, Labour's good and Conservatives are bad or something, right? And so what I said to her, which I hoped was not an unreasonable summary for a small child, is Conservative people think that if you get the money right in a country and you use it and give it to the right people and use it in a, um, and let it work properly, then eventually everything will come right. And Labour people think, and they think that everything will be all right for everybody. And Labour people think that if you spend your time thinking about how people, what people want and what people, then the money will eventually come right. So they're both trying to make the country right, but they think you start from different positions. That's what I told her when she was six or seven or eight. Now, I, th I think that still remains the case, so I'm not going to try and do a party political broadcast on behalf of the Labour Party or anything mm. like that. Um, although, again, I've stated my bias, so you can recognise it, perhaps, along the way. Um, but current political talk uh, and the recent uh, debacle, uh, mm. let me be blunt, mm. about Liz Truss um, uh, w was... Uh, a, a, what should we say, a gross example um, of a piece of uh, insensitive politicking when uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, for example, abolished um, the limit on bankers' bonuses. Now, whether it's a good piece of economic movement or not, it was simply cloth-eared in terms of what was going on in society at the time, talking about, you know, cost of living crisis, and you seem to be giving the rich more licence to print money for themselves, right? Um, so uh, that's about how it looks or how it feels. Um, but the question remains continuously, how do we even out the inequalities of our society? I think everybody feels like that. I mean, after all, Liz Truss also, her first political move was to hand out money to people to seek to resolve the pressures of the um, rise in fuel bills. That was her first act. And it's the thing she was proudest of and... Uh, as it were, most no reason why she should be repentant about it. Most unrepentant about it when she finally resigned. I did that. What, you know, isn't that something? Uh, and it was. And we know that uh, raised fuel bills will have infinitely more impact on the poor than it will on the rich, because the rich, broadly speaking, will be able to say, all right, then we won't have a third holiday, we'll pay our fuel bill, or whatever it might be. Whereas the poor, you know, the famous heat or, uh, heat or eat um, uh, debate, will have to make some hard decisions right at the, you know, the, at the bottom of things. Um, so it's clear, you know, it's perfectly clear, and, and perhaps people... Uh, some people accuse Rishi Sinak of being too socialist. It's perfectly clear that conservative people don't want the poor to suffer. They don't. But they might take the view that the best way, we need to go through some pain in order to get to the right place. That might be a position. Right? Now, for Jews, I'm not saying that Jews automatically ought to belong to this party as opposed to that one. But, of course, Judaism teaches an incredible amount about the proper use of money. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed on uh, Yom Kippur, um, uh, you ought to have noticed because we do it five times or more, uh, we do this al right? You know why I do that? You go, for goodness sake, pay attention! Right? right? Um, uh, for the sin which we have committed in doing this, that and the other, and there's dozens of them, aren't there? And, and, um, and we say them over and over again uh, as if, uh, well, I mean, why do we say them over and again? You're going to keep saying these till you finally mean them. Right? right? Um, and uh, so this al hate business uh, is summarising all the dreadful things, or less than dreadful things, that any Jew might have done. You know, we do it collectively for the sin which we have committed, right? So you're going, I mean, I go through the list, and I, I didn't 
do that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm desperately looking for something I did wrong. <laughs> right? Um, but nevertheless, we do the whole thing together. And if you look at it, if you were to go and ask the great unwashed out there, right? Jews are confessing their sins on this day. What do you think comes at the top of the list? Right? You might think, well, you know, they didn't eat kosher, they didn't keep Shabbat, they didn't, you know, what? None of them. None of them, folks. It's a remarkable fact that the al khait list is not about mitzvot. It's not about the breaking of mitzvot or the contravention of halacha. Look at them next time. It's about another word which we don't tend to use quite so much, not mitzvot, everybody knows about mitzvah, it's a mitzvah, you do it, it's a mitzvah, right, so on and so forth, right? It's about midot, qualities, sort of the moral behaviour of the individual. Therefore, there are lots of them about um, uh, speech, responsible speech. Now, there's no formal halakha about speech exactly. You don't have to do, you know, at least three good things in a day, say good things in a day, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of good speech or whatever. Right? These are midot, these are qualities. And there's stuff about um, business behaviour, uh, the proper management of money. These are the big deals. There's, there's a, a thing that might be understood to be about kashrut. There's nothing about the festivals or Shabbat or anything like that. Right? Uh, they're just not there. Uh, by the way, mostly, except for Shabbat, there's not very much in the Ten Commandments. Right? We've just got big moral principles. Don't, don't murder, don't steal, and so on. By the way, don't murder, not don't kill. That's a whole other thing. Right? Um, so, in the al khait list, we know that we're talking about what you know, British people might say is decent behaviour. Right? Behaving decently. Not behaving halachically or all those kinds of things. So what constitutes behaving decently in a society where there is clearly inequality? Guys, this is a no-brainer, right? What constitutes behaving decently is at least not making it worse, right? And at best doing something to make it a bit fairer. Let me be clear again. You might think that the best way to make it fairer is to vote Labour or to vote Conservative you might think they've got the right nostrums and solutions to make it fairer, right? But it seems to me inescapable that a responsible Jew, if you, if you like a frum Jew, should be doing something to make society fairer. You cannot, to use a nice New Testament phrase, pass by on the other side, right? This is our business. And we're not just talking about Jews. Maimonides um, talks about uh, taxonomy of uh, giving uh, tzedakah. Now, we just need to understand, excuse me, I'm just going to get myself a bit of tea. Um, you all know that the term tzedakah is frequently translated as charity. It's a dreadful translation, right? Um, the word charity comes from a Latin word, caritas. Caritas uh, was uh, one of the noble virtues um, of Roman society. So Roman society divided, I mean, there were obviously massive people who didn't count altogether, but amongst the people who counted Roman citizens, the Roman society was broadly divided into two large groups, there were subgroups amongst them, but there were patricians and plebeians. That's where 1984 gets the term plebs, right? Uh, patricians and plebeians, roughly the nobility and the ordinary folk. And it was understood that patricians, in order to demonstrate their quality, their, their patrician quality, should manifest certain moral qualities that you don't, don't expect of everybody, right? One of those was caritas, was being kindly and generous and so on to the unfortunate, right? Now, therefore, caritas, charity, is a virtue. So, I walk down the street and there's a fellow rattling a tin saying, please give to whatever it is, right? 
And I say, I'm awfully sorry, I'm busy, or I haven't got any money, or I can't be bothered, or whatever it is, and I carry on down the road. I started off neutral, I walked past the tin, I continued neutral. I mean, I'm not virtuous, because I didn't put any money in it, right? But I'm not wicked, am I? I just didn't put any money in it. Because it's a patrician value, it's a, it's a noble value, and I didn't do that, because I'm just an ordinary person. Imagine now, I'm walking down the street and he rattles his tin at me and I go, oh yes, certainly, here's a penny, my fine fellow, right? Now, two things. First of all, I can walk down the street and go, look what I did, you know, I'm virtuous now, I gave some money, right? He, on the other hand, might say, a penny? Who the hell do you think you are? I can see by your astonishing costume of high value, look, right, that you can afford far more than a penny. Take your penny back! It's an insult, right? Because he's got some values too. There's no way for me to behave. I'm pretending I'm virtuous and I'm not. Okay? That's a perfectly legitimate pair of encounters in contemporary Western Christianized, post Christian, para neo legal Christian society. Okay? <clears throat> now imagine that we're in a Jewish society. I'm not going to give charity now. It's not caritas, it's tzedakah. Tzedakah comes from the word tzedek, which means justice. Right? This is no longer a virtue, it's about fairness. So, I'm walking down the street and some guy comes to me with a tin, it's a Jewish tin now, right? And I say, I'm awfully sorry, I haven't got any money, I can't be bothered, I'm not in the mood, right? Whatever it is, and I carry on down. And what have I just done? I have just been asked to be fair and I have refused. I should be slinking down the road, hanging my head in shame, because I have now acted unfairly. Right? Imagine instead, the next day, I'm walking down the road, and the chap says, please give it to this Jewish tin. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Jewish tin, actually. It's just, you are a Jewish person, please give to this tin. Right? And I say, certainly, my good man, here is a penny. Right? And now I have been a little bit fair, a little bit, because I've taken something of mine and I've given it to somebody who needs it. And he says, thank you. That's not as much as you could afford, but still that penny will be useful to somebody and I appreciate it. Because he's not trying to judge my virtue here. All he's trying to do is secure some redistribution of my wealth to the poor. That's it. That's sadaka. Right? That's sadaka. It's justice. It's fair. Now, Maimonides, great 12th century rabbi, um, uh, took to writing halakha down, uh, and he was very good at the kind of taxonomy of things. He, he unpacked it very precisely. He's a very clear writer and clear thinker. Um, and he wrote Hilchot Sadaka, the laws of, of uh, Sadaka. I, I do think it's an untranslatable word, but I might slip into charity because I speak English too. Um, so, um, in his Hilchot Sdacha, he talked about the layers or the, the increasing qualities of Tzedakah. So, the lowest quality is giving less than you can afford grudgingly. It's still Tzedakah because you've given something. That's the point. But it's not very beautiful. Right? And everybody knows that when doing a mitzvah, you should try and beautify it. Right? If you can get a lovely lulav, that's better than getting a scritty little thing. Right? If you can make a nice sukkah, that's nicer than having a dump. Right? So you try to beautify a mitzvah, if you can. And obviously, if you're going to give it tzedakah, it would be lovely at least to give it with a bit of enthusiasm. It would be nicer if you gave it a bit more generously. And so on. Right? And the grades go up, right? giving less than you can afford, grudgingly and so on, giving anonymously, giving so that the recipient doesn't know who you are, you don't know who the recipient is, and on and on, until finally you get to the top rank, which is taking a poor person into partnership. Right here you have completely uh, accepted the dignity of the recipient. Right? They're equal to me, and that's all there is to it. Right? It's a, it's a beautiful uh, taxonomy. You might disagree with this or that layer, but it's well thought through. 
He also says that if you... Let's imagine you only have a pound in your hand and you can't split it into anything else. You've got six tins in front of you. What do you give to? He says you give first to the Jewish poor in your own town. Right? Then you give... What do you think comes next? According to Maimonides. Jewish poor in the next town. The non-Jewish poor in your own town. Then you give to the Jewish poor elsewhere. And then you give to the non-Jewish poor elsewhere. Now, he makes these ripples. Uh, uh, when he says elsewhere, he says in, in your country, I think, and then he says beyond your country. Right? At no point does he say, and at that point you can stop. Because, of course, if you have wealth to redistribute, you should redistribute it. Now, at the same time, the halakha is clear that you should not impoverish yourself. I mean, the rabbis are actually scathing about the stupidity of giving so much tzedakah that you become a recipient of tzedakah. Right? It's truly stupid. But they're also clear that nobody is relieved of the responsibility to give tzedakah. Now, I actually had a practical example of this. Uh, many, many years ago, I, I have to say, I'm not really into the Western War. I think it's all a bit idolatrous. I'd rather knock it down. But anyway, that's a separate story. Another talk, maybe. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, the, the goal of Jews now is to talk to a wall. It's quite depressing, really, isn't it, when you think about it? Um, but anyway... Um, I went down to the Western Wall in the early days before I'd really thought about it. Um, and it was Friday afternoon. I'd, I'd got ready for Shabbat. And I was told that it's all jolly jolly down there on Friday afternoon. So I thought I'd go down and, and, and join in. I get down there. And as you know, there's a huge number of folk there begging for bits of money for various causes. Um, and when I get there, uh, one of these chaps comes up to me and he shakes a tin in my face or something. Uh, and I say, I'm sorry, I haven't got any money. Says, it's true, I've, I'm ready for Shabbat, right? He immediately plunges his hand into his pocket, takes out a coin and gives it to me. Right? He's a collector, he's a beggar. He gives me money because I say I haven't got any money. That's a beautiful moment. It's a beautiful moment. Right? The beggar is not relieved. The poor are not relieved of the responsibility to give to up. They have something, share it. Right? It's a beautiful concept. Um, I, I, I think you know the, uh, the line in Fiddler on the Roof, the wonderful line right near the beginning, when uh, the beggar comes in and says, Two kopecks, please give charity, please give me charity. Right? And the rich man says, There you are, there's one kopeck. He says, One kopeck? You usually give me two. And the rich man says, oh, I've had a hard week. He said, because you've had a hard week, I've got to suffer. Right? I, I think that's nice, you know, that the beggar has a right in this matter, has, has the right to challenge. So I think we have, we, I think it is in, undeniable that we have a cost of living crisis. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for that, not least that inflation has grown faster than, than wages. Uh, and that lots more people are in more and more insecure uh, employment, so that uh, more and more people are becoming financially insecure too. Um, and I think most of us, uh, and I, I can't speak for each of you, I don't know, but I think most of us uh, must admit that we are not in the bottom 20%, that we're not in that place of deep distress about how we're going to cope. There may be some amongst you who are, um, but generally speaking, we're not. Um, I think that must be the case because there's still food left. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously. You must have been in shuls, and maybe it happens in your shul, on a Shabbat, that somebody or a couple of folk, frequently elderly, come in and kind of hoover up the kiddush because this is something to eat. All right? Um, you know, so, so we're, not, we're not at that place. Right? We're not at that place, most of us, I imagine. Um, so the question must be asked. As I said before, in Jewish thought, even if we were that person who could come and get some food, what would be really lovely would be to eat a lot of it 
And then take a few more bridge rolls to take home and give to your next door neighbour. Because you could share some of this. Right? But if we're not in that situation, what are we doing to find the people of need and to help them in what we accept is a real moment of need? I think that's a Jewish imperative. And I don't think it's just about Jews. I was very pleased to see the United Synagogue proposing that, um, I think we all got £400, was it, or something, to, towards our fuel bill. And the United Synagogue suggesting that if you don't really need that £400, perhaps you'd put it into a US pot so they could give it to people who were really on the edge. That's a grand idea. Really nice. And by the way, more or less painless for people who didn't expect to have the £400 in the first place and, and don't need it. For others, of course, it's a lifeline. I understand that. Um, but those kinds of suggestions uh, is even just talking about our disposable income. Right? You know, okay, I might have to cut my fourth holiday short by a day. Right? Um, but uh, it's not even talking about that. It's talking about perhaps being prepared to forego one of those things you really do quite value. Not a vast piece of self-sacrifice. You don't have to become um, a, a, a hermit or a, um, an ascetic, uh, give up uh, ordinary life, as it were, in order to give stuck up. But it might be that you decide that you'll only have uh, three streaming services that you subscribe to rather than four. Something along those lines. Um, uh, in order to identify uh, what you can do to contribute to others. Now, the Maimonidean thing is interesting because he makes great play of the virtue of anonymity in the giving of tzedakah. Um, and uh, I think all of us have a nice warm feeling when we've done something good. Um, and it's quite tricky to escape that uh, desire for the nice warm feeling. Um, but I think it is an important challenge for us. Uh, and how do we just give uh, without, um, without suspecting our motives, as it were? You know, why did we really do that? Um, I'm reminded that uh, many, many years ago, so it must have been in the 19... middle of the last century, what can I tell you? 1950s or 60s or something like that. Um, uh, I grew up in Ealing. Uh, by the way, back then in the 1950s, my first visits to this area um, were to visit Debbie's grandmother, <laughs> Auntie Betty, uh, who lived just around here. Um, and we used to come up and see her from time to time. She was the nearest thing to a local grandmother I had too. Um, uh, my, my grandmother lived overseas. Um, but uh, uh, in our shul in Ealing, uh, on Yom, on uh, Kol Nidre, like everybody, you all had this appeal for Israel. It's amazing, isn't it, how the JIA managed to capture that prime moment of Tzedakah giving. I mean, why? Of all the things they could have, you know, you could appeal for, the fact that it became axiomatic that you were going to give money to Israel. It's very odd, isn't it, really? But they managed to do it. Well, good luck to them. That's what people did. And people, the, the Colney Drill Appeal was giving money to the JIA to give to Israel. Um, and, of course, we'd have to admit, wouldn't we, that uh, back then, uh, a number of the recipients in Israel were genuinely needy. I mean, life was very hard in Israel. Um, and uh, you couldn't easily say to the Israelis, well, why don't you get your own act together and look after your poor? I think it's a bit different now. Um, you know, it is a prosperous country, and it's a bit poor that um, there are still so many poor in Israel. But we can't really criticise, because we're a prosperous country and there's so many poor in Britain. Um, but nevertheless, in Ealing anyway, and I think in many other shuls too, uh, they had two collections on Kol Nidre. They had the JIA appeal, the Kol Nidre appeal, and they also had a thing called the Combined Charities appeal. And the Combined Charities appeal was um, also people contributed to that, and they got a fund together, and then a panel of the board of management, whoever it was, determined who they would distribute this to, normally local charities of one sort or another. Um, one of the local charities to which they always gave was the mayor's charitable 
fun. So every year, the mayor becomes the mayor, and he says, you know, my favourite charity is such and such, and he launches an appeal for that. And during that year, he raises money for that particular charity, and the next time the mayor chooses another charity, and so it goes. And so every year, the combined charities appeal uh, determined to give money to this uh, charity. Well, one year, um, the local paper published the donors to the chair to the mayor's charity um, and it said something along the lines of you know the mayor's charity this year has raised a thousand pounds or whatever it was in those days um, and the following donors have uh, given money uh, Ealing and Acton District Synagogue as it was called in those days Ealing and Acton District Synagogue I don't remember 50 pounds right Ealing Baptist Church two pound ten and six Ealing Methodist Church, 14 shillings. Ealing Anglican Parish Church, two pounds, 17 and six, you know, and so on. It's, the shul was kind of way out in front of any other donor. Everybody was giving two quid and five quid and 10 quid, and the shul gave 50 quid, right? Well, you won't be surprised to know that there was an awful lot of typical, these bloody Jews, all so much money and rich and Croesus and, and so on, throwing their money around, trying to impress people and stuff. So the following year, they decided that they would not make a huge donation because it didn't look good. It looked like trying to embarrass everybody and show off. What they would do, though, they still wanted to give the £50 or whatever it was. So they would give £10 in the name of the shul, so still bigger than the other donations, but not so vastly bigger. And they would distribute the remaining 40... I'm making up the numbers because I don't remember. Uh, they would distribute the remaining £40, pounds, £5 pounds each to eight individuals in the community who would then give under their own names or give anonymously or something like that, and the uh, money could go in that way. So that's what they did. And the following year, the local paper published this, and there were eight anonymous donations of £5, pounds, and the shawl gave £10, pounds, and the Ealing Methodist Church gave £2.76 pounds, seven and six, or whatever it was, right? <coughs> That was much more reasonable, even sort of arrangement. And all the anti-Semites wrote in saying, it's a bit rich, isn't it? Last year they could afford £50, now they only give yeah. 10 and so, on. so you're never going to win. But the aim of the shul was not just to get a good feeling. It was trying to avoid being bad-mouthed. But what it wanted to do was give to the cause. That's what it wanted to do. And it was going to try and find a way to do that. Now, I think it's really important for uh, communities and individuals, Jews, to care about how we contribute generally and in particular at these moments of extremists. Um, I think it's a Jewish imperative. I don't think it's just a general cultural be nice imperative. Um, I think all of our texts point in that direction and taking the Maimonidean position giving to the poor in your own town um, comes immediately after giving to the Jewish poor in your own town. So if you haven't given to Jewish care or something, then do so. But then after that, there's something else to be done. Well, thank you very much. Now, I got a question here. Um, I think it's in the Torah, but wherever it is, it says that a Jew should uh, provide Sadoko of 10% of his income. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> I don't mind doing that in my pensionable state. But when I was actually working, that would have caused me a problem. Now, how do you resolve that sort of problem when there's a specific figure of 10% of yeah. your income? Yeah, it's not Torah. It's, um, I mean, it's derived from Torah uh, because Torah has the uh, instruction to tithe, so to give a tenth of your produce to the temple. So this is not the same as, um, as tzedakah as such. But once the temple was destroyed, then the rabbis took this over and said, so then you tithe to the poor. Um, as remember, the only way the Kohanim were going to eat and the Levim were going to eat is if they received this. So to some extent they were the poor, or they would have been the poor if they hadn't uh, received the tithe. Um, I don't see why it's impossible to give 10% of one's income uh, to, to Tzedakah. Uh, and indeed, the more income one has, uh, the more capable one should be of giving it. Uh, you do have a responsibility to your own family. 
Um, and therefore, if you're going to leave your children destitute by giving, this is the thing that the rabbis are, are so contemptuous of, you know, making yourself poor uh, in order to be a donor. Um, but I, 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 let me tell you, that's a related story. Well, I, I was always brought up to give 10% of what I had. Um, and uh, so pocket money when I was a kid. You know, my parents give me two and six or whatever it was, and immediately 10% of that, whatever that is, um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, went to Tzedakah. And, and um, my parents and I, uh, and my brother, uh, we would have a little debate before Rosh Hashanah each year as to what charities we wanted to give to. Um, and as my brother and I got older, we became more and more active participants in this conversation. Um, so it was a very conscious thing that we did. Anyway, so I, I grew up to give 10% of my pocket money, then I had holiday jobs and so forth. And then when I became a student, I got a maintenance grant. My parents were not well off, and I got a full maintenance grant, which, if I remember rightly, see me through the year, £360. That's more than enough. Um, so £360, I immediately set aside 36 quid for, for tzedakah. It was clear, that's what you do, right? Um, and when I, and when I was a student, I took holiday jobs and I did the 10% thing there. When I finished being a student and I became a teacher, my income quadrupled overnight from the 360 quid to the 1,500 pounds or whatever it was that, uh, that the uh, teacher's pay was in those days. Right? And I found myself thinking, wait, now, do I do the 10% before tax or after tax? I was in bonkers. Bonkers. I had... Three times, four times as much money as I'd had a week ago, and I'm going into all that stuff. I was a bit shocked by the thought, and I go, ah, oh, stop it, stop it, 10% of the total, that's that. And then I had a discussion with a rabbi, and he said, look, you, your taxation is to some degree a kind of tzedakah, a kind of compulsory tzedakah, right? Because your taxation is already a level of redistribution. Some of it is sharing. Some of it, I get the benefit of the street lights or the army or whatever it is. But some of it is social services and, you know, I'm paying to the health service, but I don't take anything from it. You know, that sort of thing. You could say, well, it's the kind of insurance you're paying in so that when you get old, you get it back. I don't know, right? And I'm still paying for schools and I don't have any children in schools. So you could argue some of this. Um, but his view was that you do 10% after tax. Um, now, I don't want to be doctrinaire precisely about it, but I don't think it's an unreasonable rule of thumb. Um, uh, and you, you might feel that, uh, like I say, if, if things are very tough. Um, but we know, we know, you know, again, back to the New Testament, the widow's might, right? You know, the, the, the very poorest folk are the people who send in, you know, the 50p postal order to the radio appeal um, because they, they know what it's like to need. And so they do give. And I think it's uh, many of us who have more than enough uh, forget what it's like to care. It's not about whether we can afford it or not. It's that we take refuge in these, oh, come on, I'm sure they can manage, but I'm sure it's not so bad. I'm sure, you know, no. Whatever it is, to distance ourselves from folk who are really suffering. Um, so I, I think it's a, at the very least a useful thought experiment. You know, what would 10% look like and could we do that? Um, and if not, then what would be reasonable? Um, and of course, if you're a millionaire, or a multi-millionaire, then there's nothing to stop you giving more than 10%. Well, that's, you know, it's a, that's a sort of bottom line. Um, and it is interesting to see these billionaires now making this pledge, which Warren Buffett's been very uh, influential in, and I think Bill Gates as well, uh, encouraging them to give away their wealth before they die. Uh, and Warren Buffett said a really quite nice thing, uh, he, he, if you know him, he's a massively wealthy fellow. Um, he said, I want to leave my children with enough money that they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing. <laughs> right? So I think that's quite smart. Okay. Um, now, you've had a long chat. With, uh, <laughs> you, no, it doesn't matter. You, but uh, just a quick Let's one. Let's you first. Yes. Quick one. Um, I'm just a very simple question. In Judaism, is there an obligation to give as effectively as you can? So let's say you have fifty pounds. Should I spend it buying malaria nets in Africa, where it will presumably do more good, or should I spend it on I don't know my charity of choice? Do I have to give it so that 
that what happens after I give it is creates the most welfare possible, or can I just give it to anything I please? I think to some extent we're back to the guy in the car that uh, loses control. Um, I don't think you're necessarily capable of determining which does the greatest good. I mean, I think some causes you could decide are quite frivolous and not interested in. But if you see two things that you think, well, you know, I would like to give to that. I think that I could see that and I'd like to give to that too. You know, that uh, community theatre project in in Hackney or someplace, you know, for kids. Uh, and then the malaria things. You might say, well, the malaria saves lives, whereas this just lifts spirits. But then who's to say that lifting spirits is not as important as saving lives? So I, I think... Um, I think more important is the, is the decision to give in many ways than the recipient to whom it goes. Um, and by the way, the idea that the recipient should be anonymous to you, to some extent, relieves you of the responsibility of deciding whether this guy is the deserving poor as opposed to this guy who's the undeserving poor. Right? Let the distributor of the funds know about that. And of course there have been patterns in Jewish... Um, Jewish history and Jewish communities where the fund or the food or whatever it is has been left for people to take so that it's not for us to decide who gets it right it's uh, and again it's a kind of in in you know in God's hands to decide who gets to that because us trying to say no you deserve it but you don't is also a kind of arrogant uh, position so I would say you find something that you think is worthy and not frivolous uh, and give to that, and it makes you feel like it's useful. It's the same as your voluntary work, isn't it? If you're going to, so remember, tzedakah is money, resources, things, right? Gemilut chasadim, the acts of loving kindness, is time, giving of yourself. So both of them are mitzvot, um, but in the same way as you may feel that, uh, you know, um, working with children makes you happier than working with the elderly. It's not to say one is more important than the other, but you also have to want to continue with that and feel it's worthy or worthwhile, should I say. Okay. Gary, short question. <laughs> Certainly, it usually is, actually. <laughs> uh, one observation and one question. The observation, first of all, is that uh, whilst we are right in saying that you know, our property is now worth £2 million, move down the road, spend the £2 million quid if you want, there is a flaw in that. Because if I want to expand slightly, in the old days, I want another room, I could work a few years, I'd get enough money to pay for the extra room. Today, let's say a 15% increase is unaffordable on regular salaries, mm -hmm. from two million to a bigger number. So that's where the flaw is, I think. But the, the, the other thing is that, um, <coughs> how different is this cost of living crisis, this inflationary period, compared to the early 80s, where interest rates were 15% and more? I mean, I was too young, but mm. possibly, okay, I wasn't actually in the country for like, mm. the peak time. Mm. But whatever it is, I don't know what it was like, plus I was a different circumstance, but what's the difference between then and the early 80s? I would say that um, experiences of misfortune are not comparable. That, that is to say that it was worse to live through the First World War than the Second World War or something is, is an almost nonsense statement. Well, obviously, it depends on each individual's experience, right? Um, uh, but if the experience is grim there in the moment, then it's grim. Uh, and people find different levels of resource and personal capacity to cope with diff difficult times. Uh, and it could be that people came out of the difficulties of the 80s and said, you know, that was the making of me. I became more resilient or whatever it might be. And it might be that we live in less resilient times and people are less good at coping, even though the problems are not so great. So they might be suffering more from less objectively challenging circumstances. <coughs> How does one compare that? Right? I think it's about the experience of the individual. If people are finding it grim, then it's grim. Um, uh, it, it, certainly, I suspect that an awful lot of talk about mental health is very important, and an awful lot of talk about mental health is very debilitating. Right? And I don't know what the proportions ought to be in that. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of people who appear to be suffering in ways in which they didn't appear to be suffering previously. The school kids um, uh, suffering mental health issues 
which at least, at the very least, we didn't recognise before. They might have been there, we didn't recognise them before. Um, it might just be that we're a bit more sensitive, or it might just be that we're a bit more uh, soft. But that is the society we're in, and those people are suffering. So I don't think I can make that comparison. Um, but it, we've had tough times before, certainly. No doubt about that. I think the thing that might be missing, I'm sorry, the thing that might be missing is whether or not we have the resilience of hope. Um, so I think people, certainly with a religious conviction, um, have some sense that there is uh, some resource bigger than themselves that can hold them up. There's a famous story about the man that has the dream of his life. Uh, and he sees himself walking through his life with God holding his hand, right? And they're walking along a beach, going through all the experiences. And as he watches this, he sees, actually, he doesn't really quite see God, because he can't, doesn't quite see himself either, but he sees the footprints walking along, two sets of footprints. When he gets to really tough times, there's only one set of footprints. Where was God when he was struggling? So he turns to God and says, where were you when I needed you? And God said, I was carrying you. Right? So um, that idea somehow that, that, that there's something that can sustain you, not your own resources, I think that's diminished hugely and that's probably left people less capable of coping with some things. Um, uh, but a lot has changed, yes. Are they coping less now than they did before? I don't think we know. I don't think we know. Okay, now, but one thing is that, um, you know, we're vastly overrun time. Oh, it's ridiculous, guys. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I've kept you up late. No, 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 just no. No, they were supposed to be in bed by nine and look at you all. <laughs> no, but apart from that, <laughs> the apart from that, the fact is that all this is an experiment as far as the children is concerned. <clears throat> The, the pricing of the events, the timing of the events, how long they should be. And this was an experiment mm. on our part. And what it has shown to me, and perhaps even to you, is that there are two subjects today that, has now, that have now taken us, I suppose it's now quarter to ten, we started perhaps about twenty past seven, yeah. for two and a half hours. And it shows the importance of the topics and the reaction it's had from the people who are here today. And that might um, colour our experience now for the next... We've got a, a Shabbat lunch with Clive in February. We don't know the date yet. We don't know how we're going to sort it out, what sort of subjects. We've already been talking about that. And the experience of tonight particularly with two provocative <coughs> subjects which uh, I think uh, extended our knowledge apart from anything else and particularly of the halachic aspects of these things that's given us a lot of food for thought Clive which we will come back to relatively soon now we've, we've already yeah. promised ourselves that but so in, in saying thank you to all of you I want to thank Clive particularly for educating us apart from anything else educating us in some of these uncertain areas like artificial intelligence and in the whole business of poverty. And our choice, thanks Debbie and thanks Josh, for producing this series of lectures. And I want to say how much I appreciate, and I'm sure you do, Clive participating in this. Um, folks, what I said last time, I'm going to say again, which is uh, when the third thing happens on that Shabbat, do you try and bring more folk along? Well, that's the point of the exercise. Tell your friends, invite them along. Maybe that's your piece of zakah, pay for their lunch, I don't know what. Right? But get some friends along, bring them in, and expand the audience. Because, of course, the more the merrier with these matters. Have a safe journey home, and a happy Hanukkah to all of you when it comes. Thank you.